today I wanted to talk about these um, social meditation facilitation principles. And I mean, I think before getting into these five principles, these five things that I've found are kind of central to what it means for me to, to, to be a facilitator of these social meditation practices, uh, I wanted to just say a brief word about roles because, you know, here we're, we're training to be able to inhabit and take on a particular role, the role of a social noting facilitator. And, and, and to me, um, you know, it's, it's not entirely clear, you know, what exactly a facilitator is or exactly what a teacher is or a guide or a coach or a mentor, but it is clear that all of these different roles, they do have, they do have some things in common and they do have, and there are differences. And, and one of the differences for me is I hold the role of both facilitator and teacher. Both of these are important roles uh, in my professional life. Um, how I see the difference between the facilitation role and the teaching role is largely in terms of how, um, how things are organized between people. Um, and what the assumptions or the presumptions are about the nature of the power dynamics between people as well. So with a teaching role, um, you know, especially in the context of, a, of being a Dharma teacher, a Buddhist teacher, um, you know, there is a certain kind of verticality in the relationship that teachers take with students, even in traditions like, like the one that I came out of where the, the role is um, kind of reframed, not as, as such a vertical guru relationship, but is more of a spiritual friendship. Even when it's framed that way, I found that the way people actually um, relate to the role of teacher is still through, through, through primarily a vertical, there's a vertical relationship. I'm here to learn something from you. You have some, you know, you know something I want to learn. And thus there is this sort of, uh, there, there is a gap between us in this particular, in these particular ways, these kind of skills. Um, whereas the facilitator role to me is much more of a peer to peer based dynamic, you know, where as a facilitator, I'm engaging with others as a peer first. And I'm, and, and I'm seeing that I have a, a process that I can facilitate with, with these peers. I'm a peer facilitator. Now the, to me, the facilitator role is important because you know, as a facilitator, people are looking to me to offer instructions, to um, to answer questions. At some level, I feel responsible for how things play out in, in the group. Of course, I'm not completely responsible for how things play out with other people, but I take that, I take that responsibility on. I act as if that's true because I, I you know, as a facilitator, I, I want the experience to be beneficial for other people. Um, and I want to learn how to, how to, how to do that. Uh, and, for, and for me, there, there are these, these things that I've learned uh, as a facilitator doing, the, doing these practices and, and sharing them with others. And, and I, they can kind of be boiled down, I guess, into kind of principles. Um, so the first principle uh, of social meditation um, facilitation, for me, it's explain the instructions. Don't enforce the rules. And I'll, I'll share this here on the screen with you. So explain the instructions, don't enforce the rules. For me as a, as a facilitator, I, I really do my best to make sure that people understand the instructions. Like if I can do anything, it's that. It's I, I, I wanna make sure people understand what it is that we're getting ready to do um, together with social meditation. Um, but I don't try to enforce the rules. Um, when people don't seem to be getting the instructions or doing it correctly, I don't sort of correct them. Um, certainly during, while it's happening, I may offer feedback or try to help point out, um, if there seemed to be a misunderstanding about the instructions afterwards, you know, that's part of, uh, of, of supporting people in understanding the instructions. But, um, you know, there can, be, there can be different reasons for why people don't, um, don't follow the instructions. One is they could just not understand the instructions. So that's really on me as a facilitator. Um, you know, if I give poor instructions and then people don't follow them, uh, well, that's, 
because the instructions were poor. And um, this is the other reason I don't enforce the rules because I don't usually know when someone's not doing the practice if it's because I gave shitty instructions or if it's for another reason. And so uh, I found trying to correct people in real time uh, when that's not clear uh, ends up putting everyone in a weird position. So uh, I just don't do that. And, um, and the other reason I don't do it is because sometimes people actually do understand the instructions and then they choose to do something different. Um, and in the context of social meditation, often I've noticed that people will choose something different because of their social condition, because of something that arises in relationship to doing a social practice. One of the most common things, you know, that I, that I, that I observed and witnessed is you know, pe people will not do the instructions because they start to feel rebellious. You know, it's like, no, I'm not going to do this. You're telling me to do this. <laughs> uh, and, and, and some people's conditioning is like that. Like the inner rebel comes out and says, no, no I'm not going to follow the instructions. Okay, great. That's part of the practice, actually. That's part of social meditation is our conditioning coming out. And part of that conditioning comes out in terms of how we relate to instructions. You know, you can remember being in school, right? It's like how often... Uh, as students, you know, especially younger students, do we, do we push back on the instructions or do we, you know, we try to test and see what, what, what really, where are the edges here? Uh, and I think, you know, that doesn't go away just because we're an adult. Uh, and, and, and to me, I like to make room for, for our inner, the inner rebels, you know, and the, and the parts of us that are, you know, that are not completely comfortable just doing what, what, what someone says and doing what everyone else is doing. Um, that's fine. I think that's, that's, that's absolutely normal. And um, another reason people can not follow the instructions, interestingly, is because they might find in, in any given moment of doing a practice that they, they might actually find that something else wants to emerge, you know, that, that there's some other way that's better for them to do the practice or to relate to the practice, or there's some other way that they might be understanding the instructions and doing them. Uh, I remember when we were teaching the social practice called social breath counting, Emily and I, and, and the instructions were pretty simple. Like uh, when it's your turn, if you take turns, when it's your turn, you get to the bottom of your out breath, the end of the exhalation, you count. And, and, and then the next person counts and you're going up to 10. Um, and you just sort of each taking turns, counting your own breath all, all the way up to 10. Now, one time we were doing this practice and I was in a small group and, and one of the women in the group, um, she was counting every time she got to the end of her breath. So not just when it was her turn, but every time she got to the end of her out breath, she'd count the next number. And at first, you know, part of me is like at the facilitator, ah, they didn't understand the instructions, ah. uh, you know, kind of like smoke starts to come out of my ears a little, and, um, but just a little. And then, and then I actually, as I got into doing that practice with her, I was like, oh wow, like she inadvertently discovered another way to do this practice. And that variation of the practice where we keep the group count, where everyone counts at the end of every out breath, that ended up becoming the main way that we teach that technique. So I was so glad that she uh, either didn't understand the instructions or just found her own way of doing them, whichever, whichever was happening there, probably both. And that ended up becoming part of the evolution, uh, evolutionary story of that practice. And, and that's what I found is really interesting about holding a, a, an approach in this way, which, which is how I hold social meditation, that it's, it's evolving, it's, it's developing, it's growing, it's changing with everyone who does it. Uh, every facilitator who, who facilitates, who comes up with new techniques, everyone who practices it uh, is contributing to it. And, and so if we try to enforce a certain kind of preconceptual understanding, like this is how it looks and this is the way to do it that's right, then in my experience, we close down the possibility of, of emergence of, of things kind of coming out of the practice that were unexpected and delightful. Um, and so that's the other reason that, that for this principle, I don't enforce the rules. I just try to make sure people understand the instructions. Um, secondly, uh, second principle is to demonstrate the practice. Demonstrate the practice. And, and, and here, I mean this both in a kind of very literal sense of 
like when I'm giving instructions as a facilitator, I really want to work to make sure that people hear me do the practice out loud so they see it demonstrated. Um, so, so, so pedagogically, I think this is really good, you know, to not just describe or talk about the practice, but to also demonstrate the practice, to show what it looks like. Um, and, and for me as a facilitator, I, I do this both while I'm giving the instructions out loud uh, myself, I also oftentimes will invite others to help me demonstrate the practice so people can see what it's like when it's done socially. Uh, and then maybe most importantly, I think as a facilitator, we demonstrate the practice when we do the practice, uh, when we engage with others in the actual period of practice. And so um, one of the things that I noticed um, stepping into this role more and more was more of a willingness to engage in the practice because sometimes as a teacher you know in that role where there's a kind of bit of a verticality there can feel like also a difference you know like i'm here to like impart something and you're here to practice it um and and and, and when i was taking that kind of mindset and teaching social meditation um, i would often exclude myself from the practice but I, I realized as, as I went on that, that, that that's the main way I have to help other people understand what the practice is, is by doing it. And again, it's entering into this more peer-to-peer -peer relationship, you know, where, where I, am, I am just one of the people who are experiencing and exploring this practice together. Um, and I think that that, that, that social practice and this peer-to-peer, -peer, they really go well, they go hand in hand together. Um, they just fit. And, and I'd mentioned too, you know, in the Zen tradition, um, which I know some of you have experience with and, 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 and I do as well, um, that demonstration is important. You know, um, in, in, for instance, in the koan training system, you know, the idea is that you, you, you actually are asked to demonstrate your understanding, to show that you get it. You know, don't just tell me, show me. And um, again, this comes back to me to a central point about learning, which is like we're not just learning cognitively here, although that's a is a really important part of the learning, but we're also learning kind of at other levels, you know, at the heart level, at the, at the gut level. There's the embodied learning, um, situational and relational learning, and so um, again, to demonstrate the practice is one of the most effective ways I've found in being able to help people understand at a deeper level what, what it is that we're practicing. Um, third principle for me as a facilitator is don't specify unless it's central to the instructions. Don't specify unless it's central to the instruction. For, for me, what this means is that when someone asks a question, if I'm setting up the practice and someone asks like, well, what should I do with like my eyes? Should I keep my eyes open or should I close them? Should I be in the sitting posture? Is it okay to lie down or can I stand? Um, uh, what should I do with my hands? Should I put them in my lap or on my thighs? Um, anytime people ask any kind of questions that have to do with the body, you know, the posture, uh, or even technology, you know, should I be in gallery view or speaker view? Um, should I have my video on or turned off? To me, any of those questions, unless they're directly related or relevant to the practice, um, I just respond by saying it's not specified. That's, that's not specified in the instructions of what you should do. And I think, you know, for me, this is really important because, um, Again, it's about letting people find their own way in the practice. And it's about recognizing for me, well, I really don't know actually how you should be practicing. Like I know if we're doing just noting, just sitting, that probably it's a good idea to be sitting. <laughs> but I don't know if we're just, if we're doing another practice, we're freestyle noting, like, do I know that you should be sitting? What's the problem if you're standing? What's the problem if you're lying down? Why would that be, need to be specified in this practice? 
except unless I just have some idea about like this is how it's supposed to be. And I'm trying to get everyone on this, you know, to conform to that idea. Um, again, like to me, it's much more valuable to let people find their own way because they become more empowered in their practice. Um, they start to realize, oh, it's actually up to me to figure out how I need to be in my body. It's up to me to figure out what, what, what the right setup is with my technology. It's up to me to figure out, aside from the basic instructions, and even then, it's up to me if I want to break them. No one's going to be like, you know, putting me in jail or punishing me for, for, for doing things differently. It is ultimately up to me to figure out how to practice. Um, or as Kenneth Volk's dad, you know, told him when, when, he, when he gave him a car when he was 16, he said, ride it like you own it. And Kenneth shared that, uh, passed that on to me when I was asking questions about how to practice Vipassana. He's like, well, ride it like you own it. Um, you know, this is, this is your practice. Um, and I so much appreciate that, uh, that, that basic move of, of respecting and honoring um, people's choice making around their practice and figuring out for themselves, you know, what's the best way. Um, fourthly, um, the fourth principle is to make space for witness. And you all know, having done this practice now for a while, that um, before every practice as a facilitator, I try to you know invite people into the witnessing role if they want to be a witness. And and what the witness is for me, it's it's being a silent participant observer. It's this role or this position in which one can be participating in the social meditation through observation, through silent witnessing. And this is, I think, very important because one, it, it, it gives people a place to go if they feel uh, uncomfortable with the amount of um, verbalizing or socializing. Like, um, you know, just today, one of you mentioned that you were sick and have a sore throat. Um, you know, and so uh, it can be important, you know, to um, be able to not have to vocalize for that reason or others. There are a lot of social reasons to, to make space for the witness, I found, because if people feel compelled to speak and everyone else is doing it, and yet it doesn't feel right, it, this can cause a lot of anxiety, particular kind of anxiety, social anxiety. Uh, that can even, you know, uh, that can even ramp up into, uh, you know, a panic attack. And so this is really, this instruction uh, really in some ways is, is about helping avoid panic attacks uh, on one level. And then the other level, it's, it's to me, it's about bridging the gap between silent solo practice and this sort of more out loud extroverted social practice. The witness sits in between these two positions, you know, and can help bridge the gap between them. You know, we can actually see what it's like to observe and witness other people's experience and how that impacts us. We see that, in fact, it still does impact me, even though I'm not participating in the same way. Um, and so it is social to, to just be listening, to witness, to hear. Um, and, and yet there is that, there is the space available to be silent, you know, to let all of the concepts and the words and all of that drop and to just be. And, um, you know, that's oftentimes very welcome um, place to be and it, I think it's important that we have that that place available for us as practitioners so that we can be silent um, so this is making space you know, for the for the role of the witness and um, last principle uh, I'd like to share is to is to draw out the insights as a facilitator I work to draw out the insights from the individuals in, in the group, but also from the group itself, like taking kind of looking at the group as a whole. Um, because each individual that we support in drawing out insights, you know, that is supporting the whole because everyone is listening and, con and considering um, what's happening for other people. And as a facilitator, that means it's very important to, to work on our skill at drawing out those insights. In social noting, for example, I've noticed that there are some really common ways in which people have genuine insights. And if they're not drawn out properly, the conclusion they're often left with 
is that they've done something wrong or, uh, or that they've actually failed to follow the instructions. Um, one, one, one example of this is that people will often report doing noting and social noting that they were not able to verbalize what was happening as fast as they could notice what was happening. The sensory experience is faster than their ability to, to, to note or label it. And often, I'd say 90% of the time when people share this, it, it's with a tone of defeat and of, of doubt and confusion and thinking, I've done something wrong. But for me as a facilitator, actually, I know from my own experience practicing that, that this is an insight, you know, that this is actually a really important insight um, to have, that sensory experience is faster, it is happening more quickly than our ability to conceptualize it, to verbalize. Um, and this points directly to something about how our phenomenal experience is that the practice helps to um, reveal. And when that's clarified, often people feel like, oh, great, like there's a relief, like I don't, I didn't do anything wrong. This is what I was, this was, was supposed to happen. Uh, wow. And then, and then I can actually consider the insight in a different way because I'm not battling with myself or feeling like there's something I did wrong and I'm trying to fix it. Now it's like, oh, what are, what are the implications of, of this insight of what I've seen? That things are, are moving much more faster than I, than I thought. I wonder how fast they really, how fast it's really going. I wonder if I could see every moment arise and pass with clarity um, that can give rise, you know, to a deeper inspiration to, to practice. Um, when we properly conceptualize the insights that have occurred. And so this again is why it's so important to draw out the insights. Uh, another way in which this I think plays out in social noting and is particularly important is when people are sharing things about the practice that are very explicitly about the social dynamics of practice. When, for instance, people notice or, or share in the debrief round that when they were doing the practice, they noticed how they were censoring themselves a lot, you know, that the certain kind of note would come up and it's like, well, I don't really want, want to share this with the group, or I don't want to share this because I don't want to bum someone out, or I don't want to share it because I don't want people to perceive me as this kind of person. And so oftentimes when people will notice that self-censoring and they'll, again, think it's a problem, like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I should be authentically sharing every single thing that arises in my experience. Or there's some kind of ideal there, right? As a facilitator, I'm very aware that that ideal is unachievable. <laughs> you know, after having done this practice for enough and seen enough people do it, I, I get it. Like, actually, self-censoring is what we do. In fact, we, we censor with ourselves, our own experience to ourselves. We, we won't even acknowledge oftentimes something that's arising in us to ourselves, let alone, you know, to other people. Uh, and so uh, this isn't a mistake. This is part of what it's like to be a human, you know, to be social. Um, and, and we can actually start to see that reflected in this practice. And if we can draw that out and, and sort of challenge the notion, oh, I should be this authentic, communicating everything, you know, transparently all the time. Like, well, no, it's not, maybe it's not realistic to expect that. And maybe it's not even desirable to do that. <laughs> like sometimes there's such a thing as too much sharing. <laughs> TMI. You know? um, so um, drawing out the insights for me, this principle is about taking everything that we've learned about, you know, what it's actually like to be a human being in this practice, sharing what's going on moment to moment and helping support other people in recognizing that in, in essence they, they are not their fault <laughs> you know uh that, that this is what it's like to be human and yes we don't there's so many ways in which we don't want it to be like this and yet it is and this practice reflects that it reflects what's true you know in, about our experience being human together uh, in, in, in this way of noticing what it's like moment to moment. Um, 
so yes, these are the five um, kind of principles of, of facilitating social meditation. And to me, what they're in essence all pointing to or all about in some way or another is about protecting the autonomous choice making of participants, of really honoring the differences that exist among us as we practice together. Um, I certainly am aware of that, you know, we're especially working with people from a variety of cultures and, and, and uh, ethnic and national backgrounds. It's like, we really come from different conditionings. We all are human. So there is that sameness. There's something that lets us do this practice together. Um, it helps, you know, that we all speak the same language and can, and, you know, um, and that we all have a human body and we have certain kind of shared experiences that are, that are deep and profound. And yet there is this difference. And to me, making space for difference, um, which, which can often be experienced as a threat, you know, to, be, to be honest and frank, you know, sometimes we experience difference as threatening. You know, it's like, ah, like there's this new thing that I don't know how to understand or conceptualize. And it'd be much better if we could just, you know, make it known you know, make it clear, okay, this is, this is the way it is. Um, so did it, sitting with difference is often uncomfortable. And as a facilitator, we, we, you know, we really get to sit with differences um, and, and have to figure out how to work with that difference. And um, I just feel like for me at this point, it's easier to make space for difference and to learn from differences than it is to try to enforce a homogenous um, space of practice where everything is the same and everyone's doing the same thing. To me, the, that, that, well, well, there's a certain kind of certainty in that and there's a reliability and a familiarity and a comfort. Uh, it's also boring and bland. You know, um, I, I remember often experiencing this in, in the communities that I was part of where I'd look up and I'd see, you know, three or four teachers teaching and I'm like, hard for me to tell, like, where these people diverge in their views. It's almost as if they're, they, were, they were cut out of the same mold as the original person who started this place. And how much more interesting is it to be practicing with other people that are different than me? You know, that I don't know what they're gonna say. Uh, I don't know, you know what's gonna happen next. That's to me is so much more interesting. And if we can, if we can work with that uh, in a way that honors that the differences, and we integrate those differences back into our own practice, back into our understanding. We were to integrate them rather than be, you know, uh, split apart by them. Um, then I think we've done a great job as a, as a facilitator and as a practitioner of these practices. <laughs>